My last session, I talked about valuing Uber, the face of the ride-sharing business. In this session, I'd like to talk about Lyft and the other ride-sharing companies. Now, if you look at the difference between Uber and Lyft, the contrast is in the numbers, and here's what you see. Uber is a global ride-sharing company. Lyft is U.S.-centric. Even within the U.S., Uber is much bigger than Lyft. It covers more than 150 cities in the U.S., whereas Lyft is only 65 cities. And if you look at the number of rides, the number of drivers, on almost every dimension, Lyft is a smaller ride-sharing company than Uber. Before you feel too sorry for Lyft, though, I think part of this is by design, and that is what I'd like to talk about today. In fact, I'd like to start a valuation of, of Lyft by looking at the contrast between the narrative for Lyft and the narrative for Uber. If you remember, I broke down the narrative for Uber by looking at the total market, the networking benefits, and working my way through. I'm going to do a similar analysis of Lyft so you can see the difference between my two narratives. When it came to the total market with Uber, I essentially looked at the global market and I gave it a chance of entering the logistics business, other businesses that might not be that possible right now but could become much more probable in the future. With Lyft, I'm going to keep it as a car sharing company in the US. That's going to give it a much smaller market. On the rest of the dimensions, I'm going to make assumptions that are pretty similar. I'm going to assume that within the US, Lyft is going to be able to get at least national networking benefits, which means it'll get a pretty substantial market share of the U.S. ride-sharing market. A much smaller one maybe than Uber, but still a significant market share. It'll have the competitive advantages to maintain at least a slice of the revenues, 15, maybe 20 percent of the revenues. Its cost structure is going to come under pressure, just like Uber's is. And here's the other difference. I think Lyft fundamentally is a riskier business than Uber, not because it's in a different business, but because it's a little earlier in the life cycle. So consequently, unlike Uber, where I put the cost of capital at the 75th percentile of all U.S. companies, I'm going to put, put Lyft's cost of capital at the 90th percentile. Unlike Uber, where I assumed a zero pr probability the company would not make it, with Lyft, I'm assuming a 10% probability, partly because Uber is going to try to make it go out of business. With those differences put in, I valued Lyft at about $3.1 billion, and you can see the valuation here. The biggest reason the value for Lyft is so much smaller than the value for Uber, where I estimated a $23.4 billion value, is my potential market for Lyft, because it's US-centric and only car services, is going to be only $55 billion. In contrast with Uber, I assumed a $205 billion potential market. The market share I gave Lyft was 25% of its US-centric ride-sharing market. And as you go through the rest of the valuation, you see the differences show up primarily in the cost of capital, where I use a 12% cost of capital, the 90th percentile instead of the 10% that I use for, use for Uber. And I, I am allowing for a 10% probability that the company will not make it. So at least based on my numbers, Lyft's value is about $3.1 billion, significantly lower than $23.4 billion that I gave Uber, but let's hold off judgments about whether this makes a difference to you as an investor yet. Now, if you look at the other car share, the ride-sharing companies, it's become a global game. And these are the six biggest players that I've been able to pull up numbers for. And it's quite clear that investors are incredibly optimistic about this space. So with Uber, you saw this in the news story, that venture capitalists, including Microsoft, had put in a billion dollars into Uber, giving it an estimated value of $51 billion. A note of caution here. It's always dangerous to extrapolate from a venture capital investment in a, in a small company or in a private company to its total value, because unless you know the full details of the venture capital investment, you can't just scale up the investment. In other words, if you know a venture capitalist paid $500 million for 5% of the company, you cannot jump to the conclusion that the value of the company is $10 billion, because unless you know the other options that the venture capitalist got, the value could be anywhere from $6 billion to more than $10 billion. But I am making that leap of faith here, and you can see that the pricing for these companies, and I'm going to use the word pricing rather than valuation, you'll see in a minute why, for each of these companies reflects the optimism that people see about these companies. And already you see the contrast play out in the pricing of Uber and Lyft. Remember the value that I got for Uber was much larger than the value that I got for Lyft, $23.4 billion versus $3.1 billion. Well, the pricing for Uber is $51 billion. The pricing for Lyft 
is two and a half billion. Now these numbers are prob probably already dated because they're three, four months old, which might not sound like much time, but in the pricing business, especially with young companies, it can it can double the value, it can have the value. So I'm going to assume that the two and a half billion that I have for Lyft has not become vastly outdated, but on a pricing basis. Lyft is actually priced much lower than its value. Uber is priced much higher. Now, looking at the pricing of these companies, I was trying to make sense of why these companies are priced the way they are. And to answer that question, I looked at the drivers of price. You see, what, what does that mean? I looked at, at statistics on these companies that might be getting used to price these companies. These range from the accounting numbers, which in this case, there's only one significant one on which you have any degree of news, which is the revenues. You have rumors of operating losses, and you can see that, the, that all of these companies are losing money, at least the ones that reveal those numbers. But most of the statistics relate to either the potential market for these companies or the actual mechanics of ride sharing, the number of drivers, the number of rides, the number of cities. So I collected the statistics for each of those variables for all of the companies. Then I took a leap of faith. I divided the price that venture capitalists were estimating for these companies by these statistics. So I got a price. So not only did I divide these estimated values or prices by revenues, I also divided them by the number of cities, number of drivers. You see, who's going to use price per driver, price per city? I don't know. But I just wanted to explore to see whether I could make sense of these numbers. Now, if you look at any of these statistics, and maybe there are some that you can compute that I haven't even thought about, in every single statistic that I looked at, Lyft looks like the cheapest ride-sharing company. Didi Kuwadi actually looks like one of the most expensive, except on one variable, the gross billings. And I'll come back and talk about, uh, about why that might be. But you can see that Uber looks expensive relative to the rest of the ride-sharing business. Lyft looks cheap. Maybe this explains the Carl Icahn rationale when he invested in Lyft, when he said it looks cheap relative to Uber. It's a pricing judgment, not a value judgment. Now, if you look at the differences across these companies, there are some, and they might be getting covered up by these numbers. For instance, in the U.S., the standard mode for dividing up the gross billing is 20% goes to the company, Uber or Lyft, and 80% stays with the driver. Now, in Asia, Grab Taxi settles for a much lower percentage. Didi Kwadi, which started its life as a taxi hailing app, on much of its gross billing actually does not get any money. So that might explain why it looks cheap on a gross billing basis and expensive on the other dimensions. I know we're playing a dangerous game when we look at these pricing metrics, but it's a, and it's a game that I don't like to play, and that's why I prefer the intrinsic valuations. But the reality is, this is how I think investors are actually pricing these companies. It's based on a metric, and the metrics might vary across investors that they can observe. Now, what's the bottom line here? I think Uber and Lyft illustrate the difference between big narratives and small narratives. What am I talking about? Uber, obviously, is a big narrative company. It's going for the big story, huge mission, and it's being priced and valued as such. Lyft, on the other hand, is offering a contrast. It's a small narrative company, a much more focused story, a smaller story. Now, by itself, big narratives will deliver higher prices and higher values than small narratives, as you can see with both the Uber valuation and pricing relative to the Lyft valuation and pricing. But there are risks. And those risks play in as when you think about these companies as an investor. What are the risks of a big narrative? First, it's going to mean that you have less focus. So if you're Uber, not only do you have to cultivate the right sharing business, you got to try Uber Move, Uber Delivery, because that's what you've told investors you plan to do. It's more costly. It's more costly because you're going after a global expansion, not just a focused single market expansion. And it, it has the potential for disappointment. In what sense? If you promised investors the moon, settling for half the distance to the moon is not high enough. So there is a risk in the big narrative story. I am sure that Uber is aware of it and is doing everything it can to keep those risks down. I'm sure Lyft is just as aware of it and given the risk it has chosen to go with a narrower, more focused story. Now, as an investor, which story is better? I wouldn't pick one over the other. By itself, there's nothing good or bad about a big narrative or a small narrative. They each are just are what they are. You can value both. 
But as an investor, it really depends on the price. At the right price, I would go for a company, whether it has a big narrative or a small narrative. If it is at the wrong price, I don't care how good the narrative is, how big it is. If you're overpaying, you're overpaying. And from that perspective, and looking at my estimates of value for, for Lyft and Uber, it seems to me like Lyft is the better investment to make as a new investor entering the game. For those investors who entered the game early, of course, that's a different, it's a different argument. So if you were one of the early investors in Uber, you should be celebrating the timing of your investment and your choice of company. But if you're an investor looking at these companies now, at least based on my perception of the companies, it seems like Lyft is a better investment. Now, the game's not over yet. And in fact, if you think of ride sharing as a bicycle race, here's what it looks like to me. Uber is a clear front runner. They're aggressive. In fact, they're doing everything they can to block the riders behind them from emerging ahead of them. Lyft, to me, looks like one of those riders who rides in the draft. In bicycle racing, the draft is the protection you get from wind by riding behind the lead rider. To me, Lyft is allowing Uber to do a lot of the heavy lifting for them, fighting off the regulations, taking the brunt of the public relations battle, and perhaps that may be the better strategy in the long term. Only time will tell. Thank you very much for listening.